Well, just a, a quick um, <laughs> caveat. Uh, so Ryan was supposed to preach this morning, um, and he spent all week prepping a sermon. And then uh, this morning, I, I was kind of just you know, taking my time. Usually, I try to get in around 4.30 or 5 when I'm preaching. But this morning, I was like, oh, I'm preaching. So I just kind of cruise in. And I glanced down at my phone once I got to the office around 6 or something. And I saw a text from Pastor Ryan. And he's like, hey, man, I got the flu. I'm throwing up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, great. So, uh, um, so Ryan is indisposed. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, he's doing his thing at home, probably watching, probably wishing I wasn't telling everyone he had the stomach flu. Um, That's what you get, okay? (laughs) So I went, okay, you know, this is interesting. Hmm, What do we do here? So um, so I thought, well, hey, I got about an hour, you know, so I grabbed a notepad and uh, and I I ran to Starbucks and uh, don't judge me. And um, I don't support all the Starbucks supports, okay? Um, but I do like their sausage egg sandwiches. Um, and I just scratched down some thoughts, and I thought, you know what? This is what we're going to do this morning. You know, there's, there's moments uh, as a pastor and moments for these Christians where you're kind of forced to really interact with, like, what is the church, right? And, uh, and I think, unfortunately, um, we kind of th- tend to think that the church is something that is a performance that we come and spectate and that we take in. It's an experience that we come and, and, and take in, right? And, and sometimes, like, I think mornings like this force us to go, what is the church? Is it just come and listen to something that was prepared and that, that was maybe, you know, um, well thought out? Or is the church actually the body of Christ, right? Like, is there actually a, a means or an access of God's grace just simply by being together? Like, literally, if we just sang some songs and prayed and went home right now, would that be of value? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Levi, I didn't even know you were here. <laughs> Yes, there would be value of that, right? Um, but here's what we're going to do this morning. And, and don't, don't you know, pretend like you're going to go to the bathroom and then leave. Um, I, I know you guys. <laughs> we're, I, I'm going to just set the text up with whatever I had time to scratch down on this thing. Um, and then we are together going to, we're going to have some discussions about what this is saying. And I know the introverts in the room are going, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. Uh, but let, let me, let, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few reasons why you should be excited about that in a minute. Um, but first, let's, let's look at the passage. Let me just kind of try to set it up a little bit. Again, I really, you'll have to, um, you'll have to forgive my ignorance this morning because I really did not have a lot of time to interact with this passage. But I, hit, I had a little bit of time. And hopefully I can just kind of frame it out enough to where we can have a, a, a substantive discussion uh, with each other about how it has some application in our lives. So let me just kind of say by way of introduction um, that, uh, let me start with a question. What, what do you spend the majority of your time and energy and resources trying to make sure that you are, are in, okay? There, there's a sense of, of, of wanting to feel like we belong, wanting to feel like we've made it, wanting to feel like we're okay. And I think a lot of us, um, if we're honest, could probably trace a lot of our behaviors and thoughts and actions and, and spending and all that to, to a desire to want to be sort of accepted, either by self or by others or by society. Uh, we spend a lot of time wanting to feel like I'm, I'm in, right? Uh, I'm, I'm part of something. This group of people, they accept me, or, or this, I have association with this thing, and I know because I do these things. Uh, we're very tuned into this as people, and some more than others, but I think at the end of the day, we all want to feel uh, like we don't stand out too much, right? Like we, we are part of a, a, a group. Uh, I heard an interesting stat the other day. Uh, I don't have the actual stat, but just the idea is interesting. The uh, amount of people now that, that actually feel like they tip because they don't want to be judged by the person behind them. Have you noticed that tipping now is like everywhere? Like it used to be you just tip at the restaurant, but now you, you tip everybody all the time. And, uh, and a lot of humans that are being honest don't really love that. You know, you like you know, get something out of vending machine, you got to tip the vending machine. It's like, I don't know, you know, do you want to tip 26% or 55%? Uh, you know, and so, and you feel like everyone behind you in the barista is going to judge you if you don't hit, you know, 15 or 20%. And so people are, are, are doing that. And I was thinking about that. I'm just thinking that it's just funny how much we think about what other people think about us. And, and not even just what other people think about us. It's funny how much we think about what we think about us. And how much of our own behavior is, is not just to prove that we're okay to others, but it's even more so just to prove to ourselves that we're okay. I, I'm a 
generous person. Like, I, I tip that person, you know. Uh, like, how many times do you find yourself helping people in such a way? And if you were to trace the reason for that, you're like, it's just so that I could kind of for a moment feel like I am a good person. Like, how much of that we, we do? Uh, maybe it's just me. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's not you guys. I heard an interesting uh, new phrase. I like, I like to collect phrases and, and think about them. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. This guy was talking about something he calls productivity debt. He says, we all wake up in the morning and we all are in the red in our own subconscious regarding our own productivity debt. We feel like we wake up in the morning and we go, I have to do a certain amount of things to be productive today or else I cannot justify my existence. If I, don't, if I am not productive today and I don't get stuff done and I don't get caught up on things and I don't do a certain amount of like self-betterment and exercise and learning, then man, I'm just, I just don't know that I'm really worth uh, the life that I have. And we all subconsciously kind of operate off of that. I certainly resonate with that. I get a man, if, I don't, if I'm not really productive today, I'm gonna feel like worthless by the end of the day. We start in the red in our subconscious. And so, so much of our life is not only trying to signal to, to our culture that we are good or that we belong or that we are part, uh, so much is also trying to signal to ourselves that we truly are good enough. Uh, we, all, we are all by default tirelessly attempting to self-justify our existence. And I think it's important that we just recognize, and that's Christian and non-Christian, we all, at our baseline, are trying constantly to prove that our existence is worth our existence, that, 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 that we deserve to, to be here, and that we are, in fact, a good person. Well, the problem with that is you're not actually a good person. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, hate to break, I hate to break it to you, but uh, you're not. And Romans is te- teaching us that, actually. And that's really unpopular, because like, really the baseline for the worldview uh, around us right now is that you're basically good, and that you're corrupted by your surroundings, your circumstances, the people that raise you, your parents, right? Your parents are your problem. Um, that's where your, your shrink will tell you. So, but in reality, what the Bible tells us is that we are actually not okay on the inside, and we're not okay with God. And because we're not okay on the inside and we're not okay with God, we spend so much of our energy and our bandwidth trying to prove to ourselves that we're okay. But it really is futile, right? It's spinning the wheels. It's a cycle where we just simply can never really do enough. So what the gospel tells you and me is that you will never be okay unless you receive external righteousness. Unless you receive the, the, the justification that is given to you, purchased for you by Christ through faith. And that's really what the whole letter of Romans is about. It's about the gospel primarily centered around how the gospel justifies us, makes us okay. Not just okay with ourself, but okay with God, which is the ultimate question that needs to be answered. How do I be made right with God? Now, how that matters, I think, to our passage this morning that we're going to walk through is I think that what... what Paul is putting his fingers on here with, with ethnic Judaism. And, and, and when I say that, I should clarify. He's talking about those who are still looking to the old covenant or the law uh, for their being made okay. Okay, that, He's talking not just about Jews, all Jews, and he's talking about those Jews specifically who still are finding their identity in their ethnicity and in what they know rather than who they trust. Okay, that, That's who Paul's talking about. And if you, if you follow the logic of Romans, you'll see that Paul is systematically disassembling all excuses that humanity might have to stand before God apart from Christ. And he starts in a very broad tent. He goes, all humanity, all humanity really knows fundamentally that God exists uh, and they are uh, by nature suppressing that truth. And then he begins to move closer into the Jews themselves. And now he is, um, is kind of disassembling the Jews' excuses. See, the, the Jews had this idea, and it was never told them by God, they just assumed it, that because they were Jews, they were okay with God. But God never really said that. See, God made a covenant with Israel. That was a covenant with the nation of Israel. But no one in Israel was ever saved because they were in covenant with God. They were saved by what? Faith. By grace, through faith. Okay, always. In Hebrews, when we taught through Hebrews, this becomes very clear that every believer through all of time has always been saved by their faith in God's provisional grace. And so the Jews started to think, though, that this covenant that they had, that their nation had, the the covenant marked by circumcision, gave them justification before God. I'm okay because I'm part of this crowd. I'm okay because I'm in this nation. I'm okay because I know these things. 
To me, that right there, what I just said, has huge resonance with cultural Christianity today. Many of us think we're okay with God because we know things about God. We, we, I, I know these things, and those people out there don't know these things, so therefore I'm okay with God. And what he's going to say in our passage, and you'll see it as we read it again, we look a little more closely, you'll see that he, he puts his finger on that. He says, you guys think because you know these things and the Gentiles don't, that therefore you're okay with God. And guess what? That's not what makes you okay with God. Knowing stuff about God doesn't make you okay with God. Okay? Thank you, Levi. I'll pay, I'll pay you afterwards. A dollar for every encouragement. No. Um, <laughs> this, this is kind of the way they were, they were thinking. This is the way they were operating. And they had very much, they had taken a lot of confidence, a lot of stock in the fact that they presented as Jews. Their Jewishness. Their Jewishness is what they looked to for their salvation. Um, and that had become their identity. And so Paul is doing something that it's, it's incredibly hard to overstate um, how, uh, <laughs> how opposite of the thinking of the day this would have been for the Jews. To, for Paul to come in and go, actually, what makes you God's people is not your Jewishness. It's not your circumcision. It's not that you know the oracles of God, that you have the Old Testament, that you have the law, that you have the temple. None of those things make you right with God. Uh, what actually makes you right with God is your, is your faith. It's your trust in God, your circumcision of the heart. Uh, and in doing that, Paul is leveling the playing field so that when he gets to the second half of Romans chapter three, he can begin to present the good news of how we can be made righteous. Not by our ethnicity, not by who we know, not by what we know, not by where we came from, not by, by what thing we go to or what we associate with, not by the, the signals that we put off to culture that, that show that we're in, but no, it's, it's all about who you trust. Your salvation is entirely by who you trust, not what you know about him, not who you associate with, none of those things. It's kind of what he's gonna, gonna get at here. So that's kind of just me framing out kind of the big idea. Um, I think where this has so much crossover though for us as um, modern evangelicals in, in a, even a post-Christian culture is that we do oftentimes very much look to the way we present ourselves for our justification. I hear it all the time. Like when I ask people, and, and if this is you, don't take it personally, but I ask people like, tell me your testimony and they start telling me about when they started going to church and that's kind of where it ends. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, I mean, like, tell me when you got saved, not like when you started going to church. Because going to church actually is not getting saved. Did you know that? It's just not. So, so it is a way to, to, to uh, easily can become a way to say, look, I am right with God because I do go to church or because I do this or that. We, we've picked up this, just like the Jews did in the first century, we've picked up this kind of smorgasbord, anytime you get a chance to use that word, use it, because it's super fun to say. We've picked up this smorgasbord of ways that we sort of signal that we are in. Okay, I remember, uh, and this is embarrassing to even tell the story, but I didn't have time to think about it, so I'm just gonna tell you. Uh, when, when I started going to a, a church out in the Applegate, um, uh, you'll, it's Applegate, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, why, why try to be, okay, I started going to Applegate. And, and it was kind of this new subculture, and, and God was doing really cool things. It was really healthy. There was a lot of good stuff happening. Uh, but there was some like virtue signaling that was happening within that culture. You know what I mean by that? There were some things that like, if you did those things, you were like more spiritual. King James Bible, okay? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so one of those things was not just a King James Bible. It was a King James Bible that looked like it had been left out in the rain for like <laughs> six years and had like ink all throughout it and was covered in a, a custom leather. Th some of you guys have one of those in your hand right now. Hey! Hey, Jeff. Okay, like, so, so that Bible, like, when, cause, because John Corson had one, man, and he's big guns, and he's up there, you know, ho, 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 and he's, and, and he's, and it's like, man, this is what happens when you don't prep a sermon. You just say things you shouldn't say. And we all looked at John, and he's like, oh, man, he's got that Bible, and it's leather, and it looks like he's read it 6,000 times, and, and it's King James, and, man, it's just so cool, and, like, fits right under your arm, and, like, how do I get one of those? And, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, oh, he's got one, and he's got one, and she's got one, and like, oh, man, well, my Bible's brand new. So, so guys, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> I would seriously sit there and, and do this kind of stuff. <laughs> so... So embarrassing, right? And I would like underline more things than I really wanted to just because I was like, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Before you know it, like every line was underlined. So it was really no point in even underlining. And, uh, and then, and then I, I, I had this 
really nice Bible that had like a, a goatskin leather, but I was like, but I want the, the cover that they all have. So, so I like ripped off this really nice like goatskin cover and I sent it to this lady and she put the, the Applegate cover on it, you know, and, and I proudly carried it and I took it everywhere and it was like my, and, and, and really, so what was that besides stupid? And it, <laughs> <laughs> it was besides embarrassing. That, that, that was me, first of all, wanting to fit in, right? Uh, that was me wanting to feel like, um, okay, I, want, I, I think my heart subconsciously was good. I want to graduate, right? I want to be, be spiritually mature. And well, spiritually mature seems to look like that. So like, that's what I need to do, right? Uh, and, and we do that with all kinds of things in church uh, culture. We do that with verbiage. Like, man, that guy talks really spiritual. I like how he, he you know, he, he doesn't just say, let's have lunch. He says, let's break bread or whatever. You're like, oh, I like that. Like, it's, that's, a, that's really spiritual. Like, that's really holy, you know? Um, we, we just pick up these things and then we start to put them in, in, our, in, our, in our little bag and that little bag sits on our scale and it tells us that we're okay. It tells us that we're in. It tells us that we're part of the crew. We're part of the culture. And when we start to feel like, oh, maybe I'm not okay, we're like, yeah, but look at my Bible. And, and look, here I am at church on Sunday. All those people aren't at church. And look at all the things I know. And I know theology. And, and I say the right things. And I can pray right. And I do all this stuff. And we start to look to those things to our, as our assurance rather than simple trust and faith in God's provision. We do this. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. We do this. We just do it all the time. And this is exactly what the Jews had done. They really liked their Jewishness. They really liked it. Uh, because it, it was impressive. You know, they had the temple. The temple was impressive. They had uh, the lineage of the prophets, man. I mean, they, they, they had the feasts, and it was a really, like, Judaism was an impressive thing. Um, and, and so much of it was good and is good, and so much of it was meant to point them to Christ. But in reality, they sort of exchanged the justification of Jesus, and in place, they said, no, we'll take our Jewishness. We like this better. This really makes us feel like we're in. Okay, and so I think there's so much similarity between, uh, you know, uh, Christian culture in, in, our, in our day and that. So keeping that all in mind, let's read the text together and let's just kind of see what Paul's going to do here. Verse 17 of chapter 2. But if you call yourself a Jew, okay, and, and wrapped up in that sentence right there is you, you're saying I am in covenant with God. I belong to God. I'm a child of God. Okay, if you call yourself a child of God, if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children having the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? So Paul is kind of tongue-in-cheek here, I think, sarcastically in a way, saying, here's all of the estimations that you have of yourself. You have the truth. And they did. You know the truth. And they did. They had the scriptures, right? Very much so. Uh, you, you look at the world and you say the world is, is sinful. And, and they are. I mean, all of these things he's saying are, are true, but they're very much the estimation of the Jews of themselves. But then he gets his hook in on the side here in 21. And he says, then you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? And that's the word Brian used last week in his sermon, hypocrisy. Here's the hypocrisy. It's, 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 it's not true. Under the surface, you act exactly like the Gentiles. And then he's gonna give examples of how they do that. He says, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. He's calling them on the carpet. He's like, like you guys, you, you think you're in, but in reality, you're actually just like the world. Uh, you know, it's really sad, but there, there's a map out there somewhere, I, I need to find it, that shows the highest areas of downloaded pornography in, in the United States, and they are in the Bible Belt and in Utah, okay? What does that tell you? Okay, those are, those are the most outwardly religious and pious, uh, you, know, you know, areas in our culture, yet what, what happens is sin just goes underground, and that's what had happened in Judaism, Okay? They were very much worried about appealing to the holiness culture. And when, you're, when your culture says, we prize holiness, then that's what you're going to portray. That's what you're going to, that's what you're going to uh, let people see. And then you're going to keep your sin down in secret. And that's exactly what Paul is calling them out on. And he goes on, he says, for circumcision indeed is of value if 
you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Now let me just break that down as Paul speak for saying this. Paul is saying, you say, oh, because I have the outward mark of belonging to the family of God, therefore I'm part of the family of God. He says, but it means nothing. It means nothing if you are not part of the family of God by faith, internally. If your heart is wrong, it doesn't matter what you're portraying externally. See, circumcision, the point of it, it was God's idea. Circumcision was a way to say, I'm in this kingdom. I'm in this group. I belong to God. But to say that physically, but not to believe it internally is hypocrisy. So he's saying the person that is not circumcised, but is following God is more of a Jew than you are. So what Paul's doing here, and he picks this theme up later in the book too, is he's creating this divide between what's been called ethnic Israel and true Israel. Okay, meaning just because you are part of this family, Israel, doesn't mean that you are actually part of God's family. To be part of God's family, you have to walk by faith in Christ. And if you're walking by faith in God, you're going to receive Christ as your salvation. Now, 28 and 29 really are where I want us to focus our attention and we're gonna focus our conversation because I think it really summarizes everything he's saying here. 28 and 29, he says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the, what? Heart. What is the heart, by the way? He's surely not just talking about an organ, right, within our, our body. The heart, King James actually translates it the bowels, and, and, and the reason is because it's the, 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 the depths of your guts. It's the lowest part of your feeling, of your loving, of your cherishing. It's the deepest part of your, your being. Not, not my shallow uh, affections, my shallow desires, but my deepest affections, okay? Um, did you guys watch Inside Out too? Yeah, not promoting Disney, okay? Or Starbucks, either way, whatever. <laughs> but Inside Out too. did anyone want, not a single person has watched that? Oh, okay, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I asked you. <laughs> You're just trying to make me feel alone. I just wanna belong, okay? I wanna be in. Anxiety is, yeah. So, so it's funny, they, they actually, they really, um, they use psychology and, and, and the idea is that Riley, the, the main character, she processes everything through her core beliefs. And that's very true. Okay, so our core beliefs are the things we believe the deepest, we believe the most, we believe the most. And we, we process all of our information uh, through our core beliefs and our behavior ultimately uh, in our emotions come out of our core beliefs. Okay, so what he's saying here is a believer is one whose core beliefs are ultimately in God. Our core trust is in God. Our deepest believing is in who God is, what God has said, and what God has told us. Okay, the problem with the way Pixar does it is they want Riley to believe Riley's a good person. and <laughs> She's not, okay? I'm a good person. I believe that. No, sorry, Riley, you're not a good person. Read Romans chapter two, okay? Her, her belief needs to not be in her own goodness. Her belief needs to be in the goodness of God that's been accredited to her. Her belief needs to be in the goodness of God uh, that, that he is, in fact, good, okay? So, so when it says that um, a true Jew is one who is one inwardly in the circumcision of the heart, it means that we have let God come in and rearrange our core beliefs, our core values, that we've let him into the deepest part of who we are and what we love and what we do, uh, and, and we've let him rearrange them into worshiping him over, over things and the stuff of this world. So a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So I think there's three things here that he says in 29 that are, are, actual, um, are actual marks of a true believer. Okay, actual marks of a true believer. The first one is what I just said, it's heart change. So the mark of a true believer is not what kind of Bible they carry or whether they come to church. The, the, the mark of a true believer is that they have actually changed their mind and their deepest thinking about who God is. Okay, that doesn't mean that perfection immediately comes, but it does mean that the deepest core level of what they love and what they think is now being changed in the direction of God. So the second one is that circumcision of the heart by the spirit. You guys know that the New Testament uh, picture of circumcision is baptism. 
Okay, circumcision was a mark to show that you were part of the covenant community of God. Baptism is the New Testament equivalent of the mark we carry that we are part of the people of God. But not just the baptism in water, which symbolizes a greater reality, it's the baptism in the spirit, meaning that the spirit of God leaves his mark on us. He's sealed us. He's immersed us in Christ. Okay, so a believer is a believer because they have been baptized by the spirit of God and brought into Christ, okay, into him, enmeshed into his ontology. Uh, then maybe that's not the right way to say that, but forgive me. Okay, uh, the, the third one is his praise is not from man, but from God. A believer also is one who is set on pleasing God, not pleasing man. And I was thinking about this as I was running yesterday, listening to a podcast. I was listening to an interview of, of one of the presidential candidates. I won't say which one, it doesn't really matter because they both do it. Um, and, and, and they were, they were kind of talking in circles like politicians do um, because they were saying, well, hey, three years ago you said this and now you're saying this. So isn't that mean that you're dishonest? No, 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 because this and that and that and this and this and that. And I thought, well, the problem is is that what's governing this individual is not fear of God. It's fear of not getting elected, okay? The, the, the problem is is that the core of this individual is not a real desire to want to honor the Lord. It's this will get me elected, Okay, um, so, and that's kind of, that's unfortunately the problem with most of our politicians is, is they're not run off of like, I'm gonna do what's right before God regardless of whether I get elected or not. Because if they did that, they probably wouldn't get elected. So, uh, sorry, was that too political? Uh, I'm just being honest this morning. Okay, uh, the, the reality is if we are living in such a way where we go, all I care about is what God says, then we will be consistent. We will be consistent in our convictions. And they won't, like, you, you know, you just, that's what he's saying here. He's saying that his praise is not from man, but from God. A Christian is such that their operating system is governed by God exclusively, not how do I make sure people are still gonna like me? How do I make sure people are still gonna accept me? And if that is your ultimate goal, then your theology will change in unhealthy ways. And we're seeing that happen in a lot of churches. We're seeing that happen in a lot of religious institutions and organizations where they're going, yeah, we used to believe this, but you know, we just don't think that's very loving now. I don't really care what you think is loving. I care what God said, right? What has God said? Okay, so, so just because you think maybe it's, it's more acceptable in our country to let the states decide, I don't really care. What has God said about abortion? It's wrong, okay? So, so I, I'm just wrestling with that yesterday. I'm thinking, wait a minute, so now you're okay with it as long as the states? I, I just don't understand that. Either it's wrong or it's not. If it's wrong, then it should be wrong for every state, not just the states that want to vote for it, right? Okay, what, what, what is he saying here? He's saying a believer is not one that says, I'm part of this party, or I'm part of this group, or I'm part of this people. A believer is one who says, I honor God first, and God only. And that may not get you elected into office, but all that matters at the end of the day is that you stand before God and you know that you did what was right before him. Okay, so a Christian is one who is not trying to get people to go, wow, look at you, you're in. You made it. A Christian is one who's just trying to please the Lord. Is that what you want for your life? Guys, I just want to please the Lord. I was just thinking about this yesterday. It almost brought me to tears as I was running. I'm like, God, I just want to please you. I'm so tired of thinking about how to please people. I'm so tired of thinking about, well, what if I say this and people are going to think that? And what if I do this and people are going to think that? What does God think? Live for that. Everyone, like half the people's going to, half the people are going to hate you anyways. <laughs> half the people are going to disagree with you anyways. What does God think? What does God want for you? That's what a believer is. So stepping back here, what Paul's trying to do is he's trying to get the Jews to divorce themselves from putting faith in their Jewishness, from putting faith in, in the culture that they associate with, from putting faith in external signs of virtue, from putting faith in, in, their, in what they know. And he's trying to divert their faith to who they know and who they trust. That's what he's trying to do. Because in that, they can be made the righteousness of God and they can be saved and they can actually inherit God himself, which is what Paul wanted so badly for the Jews. So badly that he said, if I could, I would literally take their place. I would literally, I would literally trade places with them. I want, he wanted them so badly to receive and believe the gospel. You know, that's, that's what he wanted. So that is kind of just what I came up with. Um, I gave you some questions, and here's what we're gonna do. And let, let, me, let, me, let me preface just really quickly here. Um, the idea of coming to church and having someone say, okay, let's turn our chairs into circles and have a discussion is so not normal. 
And I, I just want to acknowledge that. If you're visiting this morning, <laughs> yep, sorry. You know, you, you have been trained by evangelicalism in the West that church is when you sit and listen to someone else talk. That's what you've been told, okay? Uh, I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but that's wrong. That's not actually what the assembly of, of Christians is meant and designed to be. What does Ephesians 4 say? Okay, the leadership of the job, or the leadership of the church is to train up the saints to do the work of the ministry. So uh, how can you guys do the work of the ministry if all you ever do is sit and listen to me or Ryan or somebody else talk, okay? So, so what we're, one of the reasons, one of the big reasons we went to two services was not just to make space, it was to reprioritize something that we used to do regularly here which is that we believed that we needed to get out of rows and get into circles. We needed to access the gifts of the body. We needed to have conversations with, the, with Christians. Imagine that on, church, on Sunday at church. So, so we really believe that we've got to break out of this idea that, that church is when I come and I take in some experience and I, and, I, and I, yes, there's a place for preaching and there's a place for the word being presented in a monologue, but there is a real place for circles. And I actually believe providentially, sorry, Ryan, the reason he's thrown up this morning is because God wanted to kick our tail back into doing circles. I really think that because I was kind of putting it off, I'll be honest. I'm like, man, we got a lot of new people that don't remember when we used to do that. And they're going to be like, Sam, you're insane. You want me to talk to people in a circle? Uh, so I've been putting it off, but, but now that Ryan's thrown up and I don't have any else, I, I'm already out of things to say, we're going to do it, okay? <laughs> so here we go. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge, by the way, that I know this is stress-inducing for those that are, intro that are introverted, okay? I know that that, like, split second when you're like, oh, I have to turn and, like, figure out who's sitting behind me. I don't even know who's sitting behind me. What if I don't like them? What if I don't want to be in the circle with them? What if I want to be in the, I'll pretend like I'm going to go to the bathroom and then I'm going to leave. Don't do that, okay? Uh, I know that's stress-inducing. Uh, but I want you to just take a risk this morning. Can you do that? Take a risk. Take a risk this morning and believe that, in fact, maybe there is something around you in the body of Christ that could edify you this morning. Believe that maybe there's something in you, the Holy Spirit, that wants to edify someone else this morning. And so I want you to have discussions. And here's, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to set the table really quick for the discussions. Um, the first question that you, I want you to answer, by the way, there's, did everyone get a handout? Yeah, there's a, there's a pile here, there's a pile there, uh, there's a pile there. Everyone should have, have one of those. Um, the first question you're gonna answer is super hard. Who are you and what's your favorite season out of the four, okay? What's your favorite season out of the four and why, okay? I like summer because I like flip-flops, whatever. I don't know, just say your thing. And, and that's just an icebreaker, okay? It's just to get the awkwardness out of the room. Uh, and, and then the next question is a little more serious. The next question... I actually don't have one. Here, I got it. I got it. I got it. We're good. We're good. I'm so prepared. Don't judge me on the grammar. I typed this at 8.30. Okay. Um, the second question is, why does knowledge about God not always equate to greater faith and worship of God? Seem like an interesting question? Bat that around in your group. See what you can come up with. There's a follow-up question to that. And then number three, what false outward signs do you often look to in your own life to gauge spiritual health? instead of true internal faith. So I embarrassingly shared mine with you. Maybe you can consider sharing some of you, yours with each other. Uh, number four, how can we live lives that are focused on God's approval rather than people's approval? Okay, those make sense? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna challenge you to do. Break up into circles that are no bigger than five. Okay, because once they get to seven and eight, it's too crazy. Here's another thing I wanna say. If you don't feel like talking in the circle, that's totally okay. Just sit and listen. It's okay, just sit and listen. There, there's always people that like to talk and there'll be a couple in your circle. Just let them talk, you know? Uh, so yeah, break into circles, four or five. I'll come back up in about 20 minutes and, uh, and I will regroup us and, and pray and, and all that. So yeah, Lord bless this time, in Jesus' name.